Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Cassidy Diamond. I am the Associate Director of Public Programs and Events here at the International Documentary Association. Excuse me. I'm really glad to have you all here um, for this conversation around the Lost Leonardo, moderated by IndieWire's Kristen Lopez. Um, before we get started, I would like to offer a, a brief ag land acknowledgement. Um, I am coming to you today from Chicago on the unceded lands of the Potawatomi people who have been stewards of this land for generations. I would also like to thank our sponsor IndieWire for helping to bring this screening series to you this fall. We have a great lineup of films ahead. You can check out uh, all of the upcoming screenings, both virtual and in person, at documentary.org slash screening series. And without any further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Kristen Lopez from IndieWire. Kristen, welcome. Hi, I, I love Cassidy's intros. They're always so positive and peppy and set the tone. Um, <laughs> I am Kristen Lopez, the TV editor for IndieWire. And like Cassidy said, I too am excited to get to talk about The Lost Leonardo with its amazing director, Andreas Kofert. Andreas, how are you today? I think you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hi. <laughs> I'm are... fine. I'm fine. I'm I'm here in uh, Copenhagen, Denmark. So it's a uh, late afternoon here, but I'm I'm very happy to to be with you today. That is amazing. Uh, how how is Denmark uh, looking today? It's all right. It's all right. It's uh it's getting colder now after a good summer and uh, and things uh, COVID wise things are pretty much back to normal here so that's people, amazing yeah people well, go to I, work people go to school so that that's good well i am i'm so happy to get to talk to you about uh, this documentary which i thoroughly enjoyed and i think people would be surprised to find a, a documentary about art to be thrilling and engaging and so much fun at times uh, it's it's a movie that I, I had so much fun with. I guess the generic question I wanted to kick things off with is, can you give a little history of why you wanted to tell this particular story? Well, I heard about the story in, in 2018, just uh, a few months after the Christie's sale, where, where it became the world's most expensive painting. Um, and... and uh, a producer told me the story and and asked if I was interested in directing it and uh, I had I had never heard anything like this before and I felt that it, it had so many uh, fantastic ingredients that that would really make like a a, a very intriguing tale um, just the fact that the painting is is found uh, and comes out of nowhere and is found in 2005 in New Orleans, bought for almost nothing, and then 12 years later it, it becomes the, the most expensive uh, object uh, even ever sold. Uh, it's mind-boggling, and on the top of that there's the whole authenticity question. Is it a real Leonardo or is it not? And it turned out that half of the world's leading Leonardo scholars, they, they thought it, it was a Da Vinci, and the other half uh, was very critical. And then I, I felt, well, then there's a good potential for like a, a, a discussion. Um, and, and, and we started reaching out to the different characters who, who had been involved with the painting and, and they turned out to be uh, amazing characters with really exciting backstories as well. Would you have considered yourself an art fan prior to embarking on this? What was your background with the art world before this? I, I basically have uh, almost no background with the art world. Of course, I, 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 I go to museums. I, I have uh, a few uh, favorite uh, artists of mine, but, but I don't consider myself at all to be an expert in this field. I, I make documentary films about all sorts of topics. Uh, I have been very engaged with music in my life uh, since, since childhood. 
so uh, of the other arts other than films, then then music is my my prim primary uh, interest within the arts. Um, so so everything was new to me, and and I didn't know exactly how it worked uh, with like let's say. Uh, authentication of paintings and how the different interests play play into this. Uh, I didn't know the whole science part of of attributing uh, a painting, but so so everything was new to me and and I tried to uh, to use that in innocence or naivety in a way to to approach the subject. So so it didn't become like a nerdy, more nerdy uh, art documentary, but it became a story for everybody. Well, I know there's that moment in the, the beginning of the documentary where they talk about the power of standing in front of a Leonardo, whether that's the Salvatore Mundi or the Mona Lisa. You know, I remember seeing Starry Night as a, as a child and just having that, that wave of awe with it. For you, is there a painting that, that you connected with or, or even a piece of music? I think art and, you know, music and paintings can have that interrelationship. Yeah, I'm I'm very fond of of Picasso's paintings, um, especially. So I, I I have that feeling with them, and and I also in in this process I also saw uh, several Leonardos, and and I I know what they are talking about. It's really impressive. I I never got to see the Salvatore Mundi live yet because it hasn't been possible uh, during the past four years. Um, but but yeah, I I know the feeling of being blown away by by a piece of art. Well, you brought up the, the fact that you had not seen the, the Salvatore Mundi and, and that was, I had to remind myself of that throughout the documentary because we see it so often, whether that's in, you know, just still images or kind of the, the I don't know if you want to call them kind of recreations or moments where we're seeing kind of Diane work with the painting. I mean, can you talk a little bit about working with an object that you have never, seen you know yourself as a documentarian that that has been under lock and key for so long and you're talking about the power of it you're talking about the the awesome ability of it and yet it has not been seen in in so long how does that work for you as a documentarian i i think uh it's very difficult to give the same feeling in a film uh as as when you stand in front of a painting i think it's very difficult to convey that, to translate that. And, and, and with, in this case where we only had like uh, high res stills of the painting, it, it, you, you, I don't think you can reach to, to that, that uh, you, you can not reach that experience. Um, we had many thoughts about how to represent the, the painting in the film. At some point, I had an idea of not showing the painting at all and then maybe showing it as the very last image. So you would have all these people talking about this object and you would be so curious to see it. But, but we found out that, that I mean, it, it would be to, to tease uh, the audience too much. I mean, you could maybe hold back the painting for five or 10 minutes, but then you have to see it because you, you need to know what we're talking about. Um, then at another stage, we felt that the painting was uh, was in the film too much. That you got almost tired of watching it, um, and and yeah. So we had to find a balance of how how much do we need to see this. Um, but but yeah. So we was, ended somewhere, somewhere in between. Exactly. I think I think it's it's the right amount of you know exposure that doesn't veer into overexposure, uh, which I'm assuming is a very delicate balance. Was that the biggest challenge with this documentary or what was the biggest, I guess, hurdle when you're embarking on this? In, in fact, the biggest hurdle was that there were so many stories within the bigger story. There were so many characters who all had their own backstories that in one way or the other played into this uh, story of the Salvatore Mundi. So, so it was really, uh, um, a challenge to 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 find the right form, the the right structure of the film, and the the right rules, uh, the, the the right method of telling. And we we at some point we we decided that, of course, the painting had to be the main character, even though it's just an object. It, it we needed to treat it as a as a 
as a main character. And we found out that we needed once, I mean, um, we needed to go back to the painting every two minutes, but because if we went too far down one tangent, for example, with uh, the oligarch Dmitry Rubelovlev and the Swiss art dealer um, Yves Bouvier, they had a whole a big story between the two of them and, and a whole conflict and war and they they dealt with uh, 37 paintings uh, and, and Salvatore Mundi was just one of them. If we went too far down that story, we would lose the narrative in, in the story about the Salvatore Mundi. So we found we had a rule saying that every two minutes we need to go back to the painting and we need to move on in, in the story of the painting. So it put some limitations to how much we could go down the different tangents, but but um, I, I think we we tried to to turn it into a quality that we actually open a lot of doors into secret worlds and and into stories, and we don't even close the doors. We we just move on to the next door, and we live, we get glimpses into another world. So so for some people, uh, I think the film can be maybe not satisfactory in the way that it doesn't conclude on all the different smaller stories, but for other people, it can be like a, an, a quality that you, 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 you get these glimpses into all these different secret worlds and, and you, you are on a, on a task of, of yeah, finding your way in it and finding out what to believe and how to, to, to put it all together. Um, so, so yeah, it was really the script and the editing that that was challenging with this. Well, and that's what I'm curious about. You know, watching this, you you set out to tell the story about whether this painting's legit for one, and then it expands out to looking at the Freeport system and how the wealthy hide their money and the Saudis. I mean, when you initially started this project, I mean, did you foresee the trajectory of A to B of how this world? the story was going to be told or I mean how did how did this this kind of concept of world building um, start for you because I, I you know starting with the painting and where you end up it's just it's so amazingly wild yeah yeah we we knew that it was in the possession of of uh, the Saudi crown prince when when we started up and and at some point, we realized that we could actually structure the film around the three different worlds that the, the painting uh, travels through. There's the art world in the beginning, in first act. Uh, and, and then in the second act, we move into the financial world where, where art is treated as, as a tool and, and as, a, as an investment object. Um, and then in the third act, we move into the geopolitical world where where art, uh, an object, is, is like a, a trophy uh, and also a geopolitical tool uh, that, that a state leader can use to, for, for a certain purpose. Um, so in this way, the, the function of the object, the painting itself, it changes uh, depending on which world it enters. And, and, and these three worlds really made like a good three-act structure. So it, it was it was our luck that it, it, it was like that, uh, but it, it gave like a, a nice uh, overview of, of the story. Um, yeah. Well, I know it, the, it's mentioned in the documentary mm -hmm. that when it comes to the old masters, opinions matter more than facts. How does that mentality jive with you as a documentarian where it's assumed facts triumph over everything? Yeah, that's a good question. It's, it's a good question. Um, we, we pretty quickly realized that we wouldn't be able to get any proof of the painting being a Da Vinci or not being a Da Vinci. It, it would remain an open question. So how do you, how do you then end the story? Because you, you start almost at the same place as where you begin. So um, we, we didn't want to disappoint people, but it, it's, it's a part of the it's a part of the charm of the story that that this very basic question did Leonardo touch it or did he not touch it it remains open and it remains a mystery and in a way it's also an absurdity because how come we today discuss whether a man 500 years ago 
touched a piece of wood with with some paint isn't that a kind of absurd that we we spend so much energy on this and i think that has also like a a comic element as well but it also tells something about us as human beings that we we really we are really looking for the genuine and the genius and the authentic we really want that to be true and to be there so we we are obsessed with that and we apparently put great value also monetarily uh, into this uh, so so i think it in a way it reflects the humanity the story that that you have an object like that um so so maybe we maybe the story is more about us as human beings and and the world of today than it is about a specific painting and whether it's it's uh, real or, or or not real do you, I, i'm curious i mean do you think the Salvatore Mundi is is a Leonardo did you not want to form an opinion you know how do you look at it as as a as a Leonardo or not I I see myself as a complete uh, out, outsider or a lay person in this matter so I I don't think my opinion should should have any weight I decided to remain open because I think there's still more to be said about it I think maybe in the future we will have technology that can actually examine the painting even further than than what has already been done. Um, I also think storytelling wise that it's more interesting to to let the viewer uh, become the detective in the story and not trying to impose any any opinion uh, from my side on the viewer. So so I think that's a more interactive way of, of telling a story. Well, I, I found it really ironic to be watching this documentary as we're talking about you know, because so much of this story is about people infusing this painting with meaning, whether it's a Leonardo, whether it's valuable or not. And we're seeing now, I don't know if you uh, are following the rise of NFTs, the, the non-fungible objects. Was it, I mean, for you embarking on this, was it, is it ironic to be talking about the legitimacy and the value of this as we are seeing so many of these, these uh, stories about you know, buying, you're not technically buying something, you're buying the ownership of something. Yeah, I, I think it has reached a, a level where it's, it makes no sense anymore. Uh, I, I think, of course, that Da Vinci should be uh, very expensive. Or it, it's, it's natural that he is because it's so rare and what he did was so fantastic. But, but it has reached a, a level that is totally out of proportion. Um, and I, I also think it's, it's it's sad in a way that that uh, the most expensive or the most the most uh, fantastic uh, art that we have it it all belongs to these extremely wealthy people who tend not really to 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 look at the paintings themselves or to show them to others they they stock them away in freeports and and in a way they they get lost because we 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 can't get access to them I think that's that's a very sad. Uh, result of, of this this whole hype of of, uh, of old masters and, and also contemporary art. Exactly. Well, and it, it leads me to you know to ask you know as a as a documentarian, I know one of the the big things you know or really for any filmmaker is to have their work shown. It's why we watch movies to see it. And yet in the art world, the goal is really sometimes to not show anybody, but maybe one person or put it on a yacht and that's where it is forever. I mean, how, how do you, I guess, look at the relationship that the wealthy have to art in the sense that it's not for the people, it's kind of, you know, a bargaining chip or it's some nice little mantelpiece tool on a, on a yacht that nobody ever gets to see. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, uh, I, think, I think there are probably extremely wealthy people who has art collections and who share them. So it's, I, I can't be too general about it, but but I think it's it it's not not showing uh, fantastic art uh, is 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 like totally against the purpose of art, which I think is to express oneself as an artist and to share your view of the world with with others, and especially when you when you go back in time and and you you uh, you are able to 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 experience how how uh, artists 500 years ago they they saw uh, beauty or they saw life 
I mean, that's it's very valuable for us to to be able to see that. And 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 uh, yeah, it just makes me sad that it, it, it's not accessible. And it's it's really like it, it's thousands, if not hundred thousands, of uh, art pieces that are are stuck away in, in these three ports. Exactly. Well, and that's that's an element of the documentary I was I was so struck by is talking about the Freeport system and Eves Bouvier being such a shadowy yet colorful character. There's a moment in the documentary where we're we're in a Freeport and we're looking at all of the different uh, art and stuff that is is being held in this very nice underground showroom, or at least that's what it looks like. Uh, can you talk about bringing that element into the story and and finding a free port and looking at it and being able to go in and see what it looks like. Yeah, for, for me, the whole phenomenon of free ports was, was new. I, I, I have I had, of course, heard about tax-free zones and, and stuff like that, but I, I didn't know that these like top secure uh, warehouses, that they existed, and I didn't know exactly how they functioned. But but luckily, to for for our film, we we got in touch with Yves Bouvier, who, who played a major role in in the Salvatore Mundi story, but who was also uh, known as the king of free ports because he developed this system. He he didn't invent it, but but he was a big player at the Geneva free port, and and actually at the same time he was dealing with the Russian oligarch. He developed this concept of free ports around the world, and and he he has uh, I think. He, he has like four free ports and I think now he's sold one of them because he's in trouble. Uh, and, and even Ribolovlev was also planning for a free, a free port in Vladivostok. So he also saw that potential and he was planning to, to trade uh, diamonds in this free port in Russia from Siberia. Um, so it's something that is taking place. And it's, I also heard that in the UK, they, there are plans for, for free ports. Uh, so, so it's it's something that is very attractive uh, for the the world elite or the extreme, the the the, the billionaires. Um, at the same time, the European Union they are aware of the the problem, so they are trying to to put restrictions on them. Uh, I'm curious to see if if that if they will succeed in that because they are dealing with some very powerful people. So I think it's going to be a struggle, but but uh, I. I'm happy to bring more attention to this phenomenon because I think it's it's uh, undermining uh, our society that 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 uh, they can the billionaires can avoid paying tax and they can store all the valuables uh, so they are not to be seen, not to be registered, and so on. They can sell them, buy them. Yeah, it's like a parallel world, like a a toy toy store for billionaires. <laughs> So, so it was it was easy to get access to I would assume that people wouldn't want you to see these these areas but was it was it easy to get access to it, it was actually itself? it was actually easy because we we were there with Yves Bouvier who was the owner of the free port so I think without that connection we probably wouldn't have been invited to to the place but he was he was eager to tell his part of the story and and he he felt that he was uh, if not innocent, that he was not uh, he was not uh, guilty of fraud in the relation to to Rivalovlev. Um So so he wanted. I, I guess he thought that the film could be his his platform to to tell his part of the story. So we had to be a little careful about that and 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 not just letting him uh, paint his own portrait, but but also be critical towards uh, his story. Well, I know you've been you've been doing documentaries for for a while. This is your seventh, if if uh, IMDb is correct. You know, for for you as as a documentarian, what was the biggest thing you learned from your past documentary works that you applied to this project? This this film is very different from my other films. I, I think I made like twelve films, but they are not all on IMDb. But uh, but I, I IMDb on... always lets me down. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, it, I normally make very different films. Uh, they are normally centered around just one or two or three characters that I follow over time. And it, it's, it's often a more like intimate uh, portrait of, of a person going through a, a challenging time in, in his or her life. Uh, that's my regular method of storytelling. And with this, it was 
very different because the the nature of the story, uh, yeah, um, show, showed another another direction, which which was like a cacophonic piece with many opinions, many characters, many different arenas, and and um, for me that was a big challenge because I'm I'm not uh, I I don't have like I I want to be attached to one character and one. Uh, yeah, I want to be touched by a character's situation. I want to get really close to them. I want to be, yeah, engaged in, in, in all sorts of ways in order to tell a story. And with this, I mean, I, I had to relate to all these different characters. And and uh, for me, the in a way, the key was uh, the restorer, Diane Modestini, because she, I felt that her backstory and her situation uh, having restored the painting after losing her husband, um, being accused of uh, of uh, creating the Da Vinci herself, and and later trying to defend the painting and her own integrity, I felt that it that really had an impact on me and had potential for a whole story in itself, like a, a proper character portrait. And my ambition was to kind of blend that portrait into this cacophonic piece of people discussing the painting, discussing the world and so on. So, so that was like a, a big challenge. And I, I think I, yeah, I learned a lot about, about, uh, yeah, how to, how to create a structure, how to have like a narrative spine in a story, what's important for your story and what's not, even though it's super intriguing or interesting. So, so I, I, I guess I learned how to how to deal with a very complex story in a in a quite uh, yeah more more simple way. Exactly, exactly. Why? Well, I, I mean, I'm curious. You know, you're packing a lot of stuff into this documentary already, but were there lines of story or thought you wanted to explore but just couldn't because of time or where the narrative ended up taking you? Yeah, the, I mean, we, we did a lot of um, shootings where we that that we ended up didn't uh, not using. Uh, so so I was I wanted to also tell the story of the provenance of the painting, where it has been for the past five hundred years, and it turns out that it's it's full of dark dark areas. This provenance story, but but it was uh, in fact hanging in New Orleans for for almost fifty years in a staircase. But it was really challenging actually to get that backstory of the painting into the film because we, we were kind of uh, dependent on the story moving forward. We were starting in 2005 and then we, we, create, we create a machine where it, we need to move forward. So suddenly making a flashback to before 2005 proved to be really difficult because it just stuck the story no matter how interesting it was. For me, I, I was a little sad that I wasn't able to blend that in, because I think it's it's a it's a, an interesting part of the painting story as well. The lost uh, lost moments of the the lost Leonardo. I'm ready for a uh, bonus features or a whole uh, second documentary on that. I'm ready for it. <laughs> Great. Well, the last question I wanted to throw out, you know, is kind of it, it's it's the question I think the documentary kind of ends with do you think we'll see the Salvatore Mundi? You know, what do you think it will take for the, the Saudi government to admit they have it for starters and, and to, to show it to the and, masses? Yeah, they, they have given indications that they own it. And we saw, we have seen proof that they own it. So it's, it's for sure. But, uh, but I, think it, it's, I think it's an interesting situation because on what, what is most likely to happen is that it will be shown in Saudi Arabia within one or two years. They are building a number of new museums as part of their rebranding strategy of, of presenting Saudi Arabia as a more cultural nation. And, and I think the Salvatore Mundi will definitely show up in one of these museums and it will probably attract people from all over the world so that uh, the Crown Prince can actually succeed in, in attracting people and, and uh, using this painting as his Mona Lisa. On the other hand, I think he's also kind of nervous because what will happen if 
there's suddenly a proof that this painting is not by da Vinci, then he has bought the world's most expensive painting and, and it's not even real. And he will look like a fool. So I think he, he has some nervous uh, tension going on there. So I also think that might be one of the reasons why the painting was never shown at the Louvre in Paris because he wanted to control everything around this painting to make sure that it stays as a da Vinci. Exactly. Well, I think I have time for one more question. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm curious, what do you hope audiences, um, you know, we're, we're talking about so many things. What do you hope audiences walk away from uh, after experiencing the lost Leonardo? I just had to move position because my, my computer <laughs> is running out of power. Oh, no, no worries, no worries. I hope that people will reflect on, on, on the world and, and the mechanisms uh, of the world that, that, we, that we get a glimpse of in this, in this film. I hope they will also reflect on, on themselves uh, and on I, the human psyche. How are we... Yeah, how are we affected by the stories we are told? Uh, are we vulnerable to what's being manipulated um, by the stories we are told? And, and, and how do we keep uh, a critical sense of, of uh, the, the things that we watch? Um, yeah, I think there is, is a tendency in the human nature to, to wanting to believe in the fairy tale to be true. Um, and and I think that's that's what the 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 cap, the capitalistic powers that that's what they they use. You also see that in the Christie's campaign. You have people crying and praying while watching this this painting, and and those emotions they are used cynically uh, to to sell the object uh, to a higher price. And I think I think we need to be to be careful. Uh, exactly, exactly. Well, I am excited for more people to get to watch this documentary uh, so we can all argue on Twitter uh, and talk about art. Um, Andres, it's been such a treat to talk to you today about The Lost Leonardo. I appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks so much for having me and for the great questions.